So now that we've established a strong understanding of the influence that sensory input can have on animal behavior, we're going to sort of shift our focus now to a different type of animal behavior, one that is very, very interesting, very, very powerful. And that type of animal behavior is something that you're probably trying to do right now. It's called learning. Learning is the uh, title of our next couple of flowcharts, and we'll start with learning one. This is a very, very well-studied animal behavior, and it really shows us a lot of great information about how animals act the way that they do and why they act the way that they do. Proximate and ultimate causation. So, we can consider learning broadly as the following. Learning in animal behavior is simply a link. It's a huge link between what we would consider experience and behavior. Learning is a link between experience plus behavior. Experience and behavior will act on each other to create a certain link, and we would consider that link learned. But before we get into learning, we have to make sure we understand what is not learning, and something that is not learning is anything that is an innate behavior. Innate behavior cannot be considered learning because it is simply not the establishment of a link between experience and behavior. It is an instinct. Innate behaviors are instinctual. They happen on their own. There is no learning necessary. Let me rewrite that. Innate behaviors are instinct. In addition, they are developmentally fixed, meaning that nothing can change them. They are developmentally fixed. They come the moment that an individual is born. Things like courtship behavior, those are usually innate behaviors not learned by an animal, just literally ingrained within them. Um, also, fixed action patterns are developmentally fixed behaviors. Innate behaviors overall are simply genetically programmed. They are part of the genetics and thus they will exemplify themselves as phenotypes without any change upon birth. They are there upon birth and thus we cannot consider them a link with any experience. Experience is the key when we're thinking of learning. So we're going to define learning as the following and then we'll look at some examples. Learning is simply this. So learning. In animal behavior, we consider learning, yes, we consider it the link between experience and behavior, but I want to expand on that knowledge. I want to say that learning is the persistent change, okay, the persistent change. Learning is the persistent change in behavior, change in behavior that results from experience. And there is a great definition to use as we continue to look at some examples that results from experience. Okay, so let's get right into our examples. Learning is the persistent change in behavior that results from experience. How can we prove that? Well, we can prove that utilizing something called imprinting. Imprinting is our first learned behavior. Imprinting can be defined as the following. So we'll put a definition and then we'll look at the example. Imprinting is the establishment of long term, is the establishment, let me rewrite that one more time. Imprinting is the establishment of long lasting behavior, of long lasting behavior, and more specifically, in terms of this long-lasting behavior, uh, the establishment of long-lasting behavior respond, in, in response to a particular individual or object. In response to particular IND for individual or object, OBJ for object. So basically what we're saying here is that an animal will see something an object or an individual or hear something and will establish a long-lasting behavior upon the seeing of that thing, upon the hearing of that thing. There will be an imprinting on the animal that will cause a long-lasting behavior. We have to understand that imprinting can only happen during a certain time. 
Okay, and it can only happen very early on in the animal's development. And we call this, uh, we'll say can only happen during, and we'll call this time, the sensitive period. This is the period at which the animal can have an imprinting event um, act on them. If you do not have the imprinting happening during the sensitive period, you will not have imprinting at all. This is simply a specific, very specific time during development time of development, usually very early on in development, um, usually right upon birth, uh, right after birth, and it's very much irreversible. Once imprinting happens, it has happened and it will stay within the individual. It will be a true strong link between experience and behavior. What is the experience in imprinting? The experience is the response to a particular individual or object upon and usually after birth that establishes a long-lasting behavior. That's the link that we're looking at. Best way to understand this is to look at a great example by Mr. Conrad Lorenz. Lorenz and Tinbergen, a guy who we already um, looked over, those two are two very, very famous animal behaviorists that actually won a Nobel Prize in physiology for the first time, not related to um, the idea of any sort of uh, hardcore biology, you could say like uh, biochemistry or things like DNA, genetics. They actually won their Nobel Prize because they studied behavior for the first time extensively and saw these amazing, amazing components that animals display. One thing that Conrad Lorenz noticed was a classic example of imprinting that you probably already know, and it's called imprinting for exactly the reason that you know uh, what that behavior is. We know that when you have newly hatched eggs, right, newly hatched, I would say, let's say newly hatched ducklings, let me rewrite that, newly hatched ducklings, they undergo a very specific behavior. And that behavior is an imprinted behavior of following mom. Newly hatched ducklings follow mom. And they follow mom for a very specific reason. Following mom is absolutely critical to forming a bond, forming a link. So it's critical to form a strong bond with mom. It's really good to do that. And why is that really good? Because you will get a great amount of parental care and you need that parental care in order to survive. And if you cannot have that parental care, if you cannot make that bond, if you do not follow mom early on in your life, you will die. You will not be able to live as a young duckling. So what causes this? What is the control mechanism? Well, first of all, we have to understand that Conrad Lorenz was able to tell us that these ducklings are not born with a sense of mom. They actually have to learn who mom is. So not born with sense of, we can put in quotes, mom. They don't know who mom is. They only learn who mom is because of a response to a particular individual or object. More specifically, what they do is that they respond to they respond to and identify with identify with their first um, and individual encounters. So the first things that they encounter in their lives, these young ducklings that just hatch, they're going to respond and identify with them. And what we hope is that these individuals, these ducklings, respond and identify with the mom, and the mom will usually be there. The ducklings will simply imprint, ducklings, this is the good term we're going to use, will imprint. That's the exact learned term. They will establish a long-lasting behavior in response, in response to a particular individual or object. Look what we're doing. We are going to imprint on things with sound and things that move. So I know it's a little tight over here. Ducklings will imprint on things with sound and move. Something that has sound and that moves is, of course, mom. The mom duck 
is going to do the same thing with goose uh, with geese. The goslings are going to follow mom, form a critical bond because of the parental care, all because of this imprinting behavior. So we say in this situation that the ducklings have imprinted on mom, and they have imprinted on mom, thus they have formed a bond with mom, thus they will get parental care. They have formed a link between the experience of seeing mom, of hearing mom, and now they will get the behavior of following mom, of cre creating a bond with mom and getting the parental care. And finally, Conlon Lorenz was able to establish that the sensitive period, what is the sensitive period? The specific time of development that can only uh, happen in which, in which imprinting can only happen in goose, goslings or in ducklings. This is usually about two days. So two days after birth, you hope that mom is there and mom is making sounds, moving, and the ducklings will follow mom. This is why it happens. It's an imprinted, learned behavior. Finally, in learning, uh, one will go over spatial learning, one last way to understand learning. Uh, there are a couple others that we'll go over, but for right now, for purposes of time, we'll complete with spatial learning. Spatial learning can be defined as the following. It's the establishment of memory that reflects, so we'll write that down, establishment of memory that reflects An environment's spatial structure, ENVS for environment's spatial structure. I'll put that down here just to keep it on one line. So, spatial learning is the establishment of a memory that reflects environment spatial structure. What does that mean? Well, this simply means that this uh, type of learning will act on variation. And the best way to understand spatial learning, a very clear way, is to utilize the work of our very important animal behaviorist and ecologist, Mr. Nico Tinbergen, and look at what we would consider Tinbergen's digger wasps. Tinbergen's digger wasps. So these are insects. They are going to be diggers. That's a behavior. That's an action that utilizes, you know, nervous system, brain. And what do they do? This behavior that digger wasps do exemplifies spatial learning. What we know and Tinbergen noticed was that females make nests underground. So we'll write that down. That's our background. Females make nests underground. Why would they make them underground? Think of evolutionary uh, ultimate causes. Well, underground, there are less predators. There's less chances of dying. So thus, it makes sense to survive and reproduce successfully, make your nests underground, have your young with a safe space. But the females don't spend their whole lives here. The females have to go out. The females have to go away. They have to specifically go away to get food, go away to hunt. And when they go away to hunt, they actually are going to do the following. After they go away to hunt, or right before they go away to hunt, right before it, they're actually going to hide the opening of this nest because they're going to dig a nest underground, and they're going to hide it. These are wasps that are able to do this. Um, they're going to hide opening by putting some sand over it. Hide opening with sand. Thus the name digger wasps, right? Great name. Very easy to understand. But again, we have to understand the idea of spatial learning. How is there spatial learning here? The establishment of memory that reflects environment spatial structure. What Tinbergen noticed, and the, it's absolutely incredible, is that something as minuscule as an insect, as a wasp, was able to come back even though it covered the opening with sand, even though it looks exactly like the entire rest of the environment spatial structure, it's able to come back to the exact same spot. Come back to exact same spot. That clearly shows that the wasp has established a link between its experience of digging the hole and hiding it with sand and the behavior itself of coming back, of going back to this nest that's underground. That is very, very interesting to me. That's very, very cool. Both imprinting and spatial learning are great examples of this link establishment behavior that we see through experience. We'll continue our discussion on learning in the next couple of flowcharts.